so we can be there by Good evening and welcome to our evening service. We welcome you. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father God, we welcome you in this place, Lord Jesus. Lord, come do what you want to do, Lord. We bless your holy name. Everything within us blesses your holy name. We, your people, bless your holy name. And we adore you. We magnify you. We glorify you. Because you are our King of kings who is worthy of all our praises. Have your way, Father. Have your way in us. Lead us and show us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's open Psalms chapter 125. I'm going to read just two verses, one and two. They that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed but abideth forever. As the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so the Lord is round about his people from henceforth, even forever. Yes, here the psalmist is saying that how the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so the Lord is round about his people from henceforth, even forever. Last week we heard the same message where my father-in-law spoke and we had a, we had a nice uh, teaching on it. And luckily it was today's, uh, like, today's reading as well. So it says like how it, same way, like how sometimes we feel that we are surrounded, but do not worry, we are surrounded by Him. It says that ultimately the Lord is described as our shield, supernatural one. Yes, He is our shield forevermore, that those who trust in the Lord, will never be shaken, will never be uprooted, will never be removed. Maybe for a short period of time, you, God might be transplanting you from one place to another, from one place to another, just for you to grow in the right amount of soil, just for you to grow in the way Lord wants you to grow, so that you will never be uprooted. Here it says, no matter who rises up against us, he will cover us. We are guarded from everything that would threaten us. And like in Psalms chapter 91 verse 4, it says, he shall cover thee with his feathers. Yes, the Lord is our covering. The Lord is our hope. Whom shall we be afraid of? Whom shall we be fearful of? Because he is our covering. Trust in Him and He will make you to soar high like the eagles. And always a believers, believers are compared with an eagle. And when I was teaching my children, suddenly one question popped up that eagle is the king of birds. So who we are, let's recognize who we are. Let's have that eagle's eye view. Let's not keep looking down but keep our eyes fixed on Him. And understand who we are. Lord is fighting for us. He is fighting our battles. So he can give you the victory. And you can enjoy the plunder of the battle. That you and we could enjoy the spoils of the battle. He is our ever present help in the time of storm. Like how Psalms 46 verse 1 it tells us. God is our refuge and strength. A very present help in trouble. Yes, 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 we belong to the mountaintops. We belong to the King of Kings and the Lord of Laws. We belong to the God of the mountains. Yes, we belong to Him and we are surrounded by Him. It may look like that we are surrounded, but we are surrounded by Him. So rest assured in Him, the maker of you, who created you. Yes, He created you and we are in safe hands, in safe hands. It may look like we are surrounded, but we are surrounded by Him, for He is our shield forevermore. I invite the worshippers, come let's worship this great I Am, this mighty one of Israel, who is worthy of all our praises. So let's give unto the Lord a mighty shout. A mighty shout of praise and adoration because he alone is holy.
us, Lord, our hope is only in you, Jesus, that you will carry us, Lord, safe, Lord, that we are safe in your arms of love, Lord, that we are safe in your arms, Lord Jesus, your loving, gentle arms, Lord Jesus. Yes, Lord, whom shall we be afraid of? Whom shall we be fearful of? Because you are our lighthouse, Lord. You are our salvation and you are the stronghold of our life, Lord Jesus. Yes, Lord. You are our lighthouse, Lord Jesus. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord Jesus. We trust in you.
let us put a break every chain. Let us put a break within us. Let us put a break out like never before, Lord Jesus. Lord, let our hearts be aligned, Lord, unto your plans and purposes. Let our minds be aligned, O oh Lord Jesus, unto those ways, Lord, in which you want to lead us, Lord Jesus. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus, and align us, Lord. Align our heart. Align our mind. Align our will. Align our emotions, O oh Lord Jesus, to fulfill your will. Your will. Your Lord Jesus, which is the best way for your people's life, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord. Let your spirit break out, Lord. Break every hindrance down, Lord Jesus. Break all the walls down, Lord Jesus. As your people lift up one shout to the King of kings and the Lord of lords, let the wall of Jericho fall in the name of Jesus. Let those walls fall in their lives. Let those walls fall in the churches. Let those walls fall in our homes. Let those walls fall in our businesses, O oh Lord. Let those walls fall, Lord Jesus. All the walls, Lord, of hindrances, which are not of you, Lord. Let it all break, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Open up, open up doors for your people. Yes, open up, Lord, because the breaker goes before us. Yes, Lord, you are the breaker going before us, Lord, to make all our paths straight, Lord Jesus. And we trust in you, Lord, and we receive, Lord. We receive you. We receive the King going before us. We receive and we accept, Lord, and we acknowledge the King going before us, Lord. The breaker going before us to open up, Lord, every door, Lord Jesus, so that no man can shut it, Lord. The doors which you open. None can shut, none can shut, none can shut. We worship you, Lord Jesus. We trust in you, Lord. We trust in you, Lord. Let faith arise in our hearts. Oh, heart, believe it. Let faith arise in us, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Lord, come, Lord. All our restricted ways, Lord. All our limited ways, Lord Jesus. Break it, Lord. Break it, Lord. Break it. Release your people. Release your people. Release your people in your great love, Lord. We declare over your people, Lord, the outpour of your fresh love, Lord. The outpour of your fresh revelation of your great love. That we are loved by you, Lord. That we are much loved by you, Lord Jesus. Yes, Lord, that we are not alone, Lord. That you are always there for us, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus, lead us, Lord, lead us, O oh Father.
upon you, Lord, the author and the finisher of our faith, the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, who is coming to take his bride, Lord. Prepare your bride, Lord, as you're coming soon to take us, Lord, with you. Prepare our hearts, Lord. Prepare our hearts, Lord Jesus. Give us a one spirit and a one heart, Lord Jesus, to lift our one shout, Lord, unto the King of kings and Lord of lords, and celebrate in your presence, Lord. Give us an undivided heart, to Lord Jesus. Give us a one heart and a one spirit, Lord, a new spirit, Lord, and a new heart, Lord Jesus, to worship you in the beauty of holiness, Lord Jesus. May your people worship you in spirit and in truth, Lord, so that they may find you, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord, we open our hearts to receive from you. Speak unto us, Lord, for we are listening, O Lord Jesus. Come, Lord, be thou glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm going to share a word today, this evening, on warfare. Because when we're really fighting a war, a war which is raging all over the world, I pray, Holy Spirit, you just come down this evening. I pray that you will give me the unction in the pulpit to carry the, the word of warfare to your people. Help me to speak boldly about warfare. Because we are all the children of God. And we want to serve you, Lord Jesus. We pray that, Lord, that you will give me the words to tell your people this evening. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. One of the first things we need to learn as a part of the body of Christ, when we come into the saving knowledge of Christ, when we accept Jesus as the Lord and Savior of our life, we need to know that we have enlisted ourselves in the army of God. Whether you like it or not, you're enlisted. You're a part of that army. The army of, of Jesus Christ. There is a war going on in this world. And this war is between the good and evil. The war is between the light and darkness. The war is between the truth and deception. And this war is going raging all over the world. Everyone is engaged in this. It's not only you and me. Everybody is engaged in this war. Whether they want to do it or not, they have no choice in the matter. Because we are all combatants, we have to fight that war which is raging against us. And you will either become a victor or you will become a casualty. And that depends on the choices you make in life. Sometimes you wonder why it's so hard to have some peace of mind. I've heard a lot of people saying that I have no peace, I have no peace of mind. Peace is hard to come by when you especially live in a war zone, when there's a war going on. How can peace come into you? It's not like that you're in a war, and I can let me tell you this war is a very serious war. It's not a, a thing to take it lightly, because it is cosmic. It's got to do, it involves humans, it involves God, it involves angels and demons, powers and principalities. All these people are involved. The nations, Antichrist, 
all these people are involved. It's a war raging out there in that world. And do you know where this battle is going on? You may ask me that. Where is this battle going on? Let me tell you, the answer is, it is in your head, nowhere else. This battle is raging in our head. That's why we have no peace. That's why people come to you and say, I have no peace of mind. Hosea, chapter 4, verse 6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Now, if there is a war going on, in any war, any war in this world, one of the things the combatants do is to understand who that enemy is. And they try to get as much information as possible of that enemy whom they have to fight. Military leaders do that. Us as human beings, we have to know who our enemy is. What are the tactics they are going to employ against us? What are the tactics the opponents will use against us? And our attempt is to discover the opponent's strength and weakness. What are his strengths and weaknesses? I remember when I used to work, we used to have huge tenders come out. And one of the things which we did, it did was, we would find out who are our main competitors, who are they going to be, we are battling against. What's their strength and what are the strategies they are going to employ. And we would have a, a, a closed room session for virtually a whole day debating this. So that we will battle that as a battleground. Not only in this spiritual matters I'm talking of, I'm talking of only corporate affairs where you know who your opponent is and you want to fight that battle to win. Now many battles have been won because of the pre-battle preparation which people do. That before the battle, they prepare themselves. Just like I said, in, our, in, the, in the corporate world, we prepare ourselves. We want to know who that co company is against us, who are the top three who are going to be fighting us. Likewise, it should be also be with God's church. People should know clearly who are the people, what are the strategies we need to employ, who are we going to fight against, because every believer know, should know, every believer should know the tactics of their enemy and who that enemy for, for believers are? There's only one guy, and his name is Satan. And we need to know what are the tactics Satan is going to deploy against you. So I'm here this evening to tell you a few tactics of, of Satan. How he will take advantage of, your, of, of you if you don't be careful. Jesus tells us that there is no truth in him. That he is the father of lies. John 8, 44. How often does Satan, who has studied us, he knows everything about us. Let me tell you that. You can't hide anything from him. He knows our history. He knows our weaknesses. And he will use anything. He will use anything and everything to, to get at you. That's his purpose. That's what he wants to do. Because Satan is quick to remind us of our past failures and defeats. He will always bring that up. And people, us as humans, we're sitting on the other side, we start thinking of what our defeats in life has happened to us. We be mourning about all those things. He knows all our weaknesses, so you touch the spots which are weak. And we go into that shell, we go into that hole, crying and saying we have no peace of mind. Satan also, let me tell you, reminds us of our past self-won victories. There are victories which we win and we think we have done it on our own. So we get a chip on our shoulder and we say, hey, I can do it. I don't need anybody. 
We don't need God. We fight the battle with our, you think that your chariots and your horses has won the battle for you. But let me tell you, every believer finds one reason or the other to talk about the victories they think that they have won on their own. We need to study the word of God and what does the word of God say in the Bible? Let me tell you, the Bible is the war manual. If you look at it, if it's a war manual, till Jesus came onto this earth, there was war all over. From the first uh, uh, chapter onwards till, till he came and gave us that new covenant when he fought and gave us that victory. The battle is against that unbelief and how to destroy those arguments which people put against us. And to, to, to battle that unbelief effectively, we must press doubts and temptations into specific arguments when we are talking and when we are fighting a battle. What is specifically being asserted by the opposite party? What is the promise given to us? Only then can we know that this, is there going to be truth in it or the enemy is trying to put up a false case. So we must understand that very clearly. Who we are going to fight against. The Satan's tactics which is going to use against us. Because Satan uses, one of the things which he uses is the the weakness of our flesh. Satan takes advantage of that. He takes advantage of the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. That's what he does all the time. 1 John 2.16 He does, he goes after those areas because he knows that's the easiest to get him. The lust of the eyes, the lust of flesh, and the pride of life, he knows these are the easiest ways to hit a man. Because that's the easiest and the most deceptive traps which when you fall into that self-reliance situation. Because after a victory, if you forget that it was God who provided that victory to you. You didn't get it on your own. God gave you that victory. To give you an example, I will talk about David. Because he was one of the greatest warrior kings of, of Israel. In 2 Sam, Samuel, he arranged for uh, a census. Now, he should not have done that. Or the simple reason, because of... The, in the principle of Exodus in the old days, God speaks to, the, God has the ownership of people. All the people are His. And in the old, ancient culture of those days, a man has got a right only to what he belongs to him. He cannot take something else which is not his, which does not belong to him. Now, Israel did not belong to God, to David. Israel belonged to David. Uh, sorry, to God. And he had no right to take a census because he had just won a victory. He wanted to know how much of people he had with him. And God did not give him a command. If it was God who gave the command, it's a different matter. God did not give him that command. But David, when he came to know about it, he was terribly, terribly upset about what happened. Let me read to you from 2 Samuel 24, uh, chapter 24, verse 10. And David's heart condemned him after he had numbered the people. So David said to Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. Now what? But now I pray, Lord, take away the iniquity of your servant, I have done very foolishly. You must understand the heart of David. 
The heart of David was such that he would act quickly and accept a fault. If he has wronged something, he would quickly accept that. He kept a very, very short leash with God. He wanted to be with God all the time. So if he had sinned against God, he would immediately go to God and ask for forgiveness. That's why God liked him so much and made him a man after his own heart. He cries, take away the iniquity of your servant. I have acted foolishly. I should have consulted you, but I thought you consulting you. I took the senses. Sorry for that. Please forgive me. To God, you know what God did? God, through the prophet Gad of those times, there was a prophet called Gad. He, God gave him three options. He said, seven years of famine, three months before your enemies, the enemies will come at you, or three days of plague in your land. You choose what you want. And God communicated that to David. And you know what David did? David knew that this is going to be a difficult proposition. So he prayed and told God that I prepared to do, have three days of plague in my land. It's better to face God than to face men. I don't want to be at the mercy of, on the hand of man. I don't want to do that. I would fall into the mercy of God. And that's what he did. And later on, prof, the prophet Gad asked David, he said, communicated from God that David should build an altar there. And that's the threshing floor of Arana. And David subsequently bought that place and that was a threshing floor which he wanted to buy and this Arana didn't want to uh, sell it. He said, you can take it, David. I won't take any money from you. And all this conversation took place between them. And David said, I don't want to take something which costs me no money. I will pay for it. I will pay the full price. He didn't even take, accept a discount. He took that full, paid that full price and registered that is in his name and that land was in Moriah let me tell you that, pla that land the Moriah place had a lot of significance historic significance because in that place in the, exactly the same place in that mountainous area of Moriah that is a time when Isaac took or Abraham took Isaac there to be sacrificed. It is the same place where David, Lord, no sorry, uh, Jesus, Lord was crucified. All these things happened in that area, in that place, the land of Moriah. And that became a place of sacrifice. And that land was purchased by David, let me tell you that. In 1 Chronicles 21-24, it says, Then David said to Ornan, Ornan is the name of the Aruna. Okay, because in subsequent this thing in Chronicles, it comes, if you look at Samuel, which is, uh, Chronicles was written subsequently, uh, the, the name was mentioned as Ornan. No, I will surely pay the full price, for I will not take what is yours for the Lord, nor offer burnt offerings which does not cost me, nothing and a little later on let me tell you it was Solomon who built that temple also there in the same place David like had seen so many victories like David we can see victories in our life maybe in our families maybe in our finances our jobs our ministries for example and after a while we begin to think Look what have I, I have done. I have achieved great things. I'm great. I'm good at my job. I'm good at my ministry. I'm good at all these things. I can make money. I do all of that. 
Remember what I told? I told you the devil will remember and remind you of the victories. He will not forget it. He will, you may have forgotten it. But he will not. He will remind you of the victories which you have won. Satan will tell you, will keep whispering in your ears that it is because of your hard work, because of your own hand and the power of your, of your horses and the chariots which you have. In other words, all the things which you possess, that you have won the victory. That it's your intellect, it's your money that has made you so rich and, and got you things. And that you are able to achieve all that. He will always use the pride of life to get at you. That is Satan's game. I just want to ask you, how good does it feel for flesh and our egos when people are, are patting us all the time on the back, you're a great job, well done, you're a great guy, you're so and so. It becomes easy for to pump up people. And that's what happens. All the time you will find that you can do things on your own steam. A lot of people do that. Joshua, let me tell you, made the same mistake in the battle against the stronghold of Ai. He was victorious at against Jericho. You remember at Jericho how he got all the, the uh, his people to walk around the huge structure of Jericho without lifting a hand he was able to destroy the, the Jericho walls. Soon after that virtually the next immediate thing which came up was the battle of the stronghold of Ai. And what did this same Joshua do? He did not consult God. He went straight ahead without consulting anybody. And that was one of the biggest defeats Joshua ever faced. He lost 36 of his great fighting men on that day when he had lost the battle of Ai. Joshua chapter 7 verse 6 to 9. Let's go there. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord till evening. He and the elders of Israel and then they put dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, Lord of God, why have you brought this people from all over Jordan at all? Deliver us, deliver us to the hands of Amorites to destroy us. Oh, they have been content and dwelt on the other side of the Jordan. They're saying we could have been on the other side of the Jordan. And let me tell you, uh, uh, if people who have hurt, people who are in a bad state, one of the ways of, of showing that how desperate they are is to put ash on your head. They sit with that clothes stone in the old days. Then verse 8 says, Oh Lord, what should I say when Israel returns? is back before its enemies for the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear and surround us and cut our name off from this earth then the last line I will tell you it's a beautiful line then Joshua says then what will you do for your great name that's what Joshua utters he is more worried that he has bought his God a bad name he is not worried about losing that victory. He was completely dependent on God, but he is now worried. What happens to God's name? I have belittled him. I have made him get a bad name by losing and doing such a foolish thing. Because Joshua did it on his own strength. In Jericho, he did it with God's strength. And battle of Ai was done on his own stream. He lost that. And that's when he, Joshua tore his clothes and put all that dust on his head to, to posture, put, to show and display people that he's mourning. That's what Joshua did. 
I'm telling you that we need to, to understand certain things of the Bible. When we read the Bible, these are things we need to capture. And when we do that, it strengthens us. Joshua and the elders of Israel considered this as really a national calamity for them. Everybody was mourning because they had lost that battle. Because they cannot take a defeat in their own stride. And let me tell you, this is not a, a, a situation of you can win a few and lose a few kind of situation. No. When Satan is at you, you have to win every battle. Otherwise you're done for. He will take, create so much of issues for you. Joshua knew that if it's God's hand of blessing and guidance was there, there would nothing would go wrong. Nothing would go wrong. Because they had come to the promised land because of God. God showed the place. Question I'm going to ask is, how different, how different is it from so much of Christianity of today? Do we have people the same Joshua's who will be afraid to lose a battle because God's name is going to be spoiled? Because we are so filled in this world with man's program, the power which man wants. And let me tell you, God has withdrawn his blessings and guidance. And let me tell you, funnily, even if we, God does that, it won't be missed for a long time. That's how foolish our people are. How many people think of doing something great for God's name? So many people who like Joshua had that overriding concern for God, God's the glory of God. How many Joshua's do you have? My dear family of God, let me tell you, as we are approaching the end days, end times, that it is most important that we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. There is no other alternative. Let us not do things on our own trust, our own power and our own might. For in this war, you're going to fight Satan and nobody else. And our deliverance will come only from the hand of the Lord, let me tell you that. King David and Joshua learned this lesson. Even though they goofed it up, they learned it. They never repeated those mistakes again in their life. Likewise, we should be clear and to learn from those mistakes. We need to learn that. Because let me tell you, every man and woman in the Bible had to fight the same fight of type of battles as we have we are doing today. Nothing is different. And God is the, well, the greatest general you can find in warfare. Nobody can beat him. Nobody can be bigger than him. And let me tell you, there are certain important things which he has given. He given us. He's, uh, God has given us. A walkie-talkie. Prayer for help. You can talk to him. And he will listen. He will, he will communicate to you through the Holy Spirit. And what are we supposed to do? We have to take the power, the sword of spirit in our hand. Which is the word of God. Praying at all times. Ephesians 6, 17 and 18. When you start praying all the time and taking that word of God in your hand, which is your spirit and the sword, you will so be ready to start your battle. 
God sees that enemy lines and he knows exactly the strategy Satan is going to deploy that's why all that we need to do is all written down I just told you about Ephesians 6, 17 and 18 all this is written down in that war manual I call it the Bible as a war manual it's all written on there but we have to go in there and read what is there in that manual and prepare ourselves so that we will not be outwitted that we will not be ignorant of his designs 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 11 I pray that may God make you a mighty warrior that he trains your hands for war and puts your, your fingers for the battle he makes you ready Psalm 144 verse 1 what I'm going to do is now I'm going to run through some quick uh, I, would, I would call strategies of, of, of Satan what he tries to deploy what he tries to do this warfare to win against us to win against you and me and we'll have a look at it he binds the minds of believers that's the first thing you need to understand in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 4 says the God of this age has blinded the binds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of, of the gospel of the glory of Christ so Satan speaks whatever Satan speaks is false Satan always hides the truth he will never disclose that another thing which Satan does is he will not allow you to he will do all everything possible to see that you do not reach uh, you do not treasure the gospel he doesn't want you to read the Bible he doesn't want you to accept the gospel at all The, the, the Satan does all this to cover up. He acts, he's an actor. He's an actor in, in costume, the costume of light and righteousness. He'll pretend to be righteous. He will come in in those garbs. False. What, what does an actor do? Actor acts like somebody else, which he is not. And that's what Satan does. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 13 to 15 Paul says that some people are exposing Posing themselves Posing themselves as apostles Who are not He says even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light So it is not strange if his servants Also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness I know people who for nothing they've just started the ministry what is it you are doing brother I'm a prophet how do you become a prophet you haven't even started your ministry there are people because in today's the days titles everybody wants to grab a title for themselves you want to be a prophet <laughs> Give, put a name board, put a, put a, make a card, prophet so and so. You haven't even started your ministry. I have heard, let me tell you, people say this. In other words, Satan has servants. Satan has servants all over. He deploys his servants. And they will go and and go and get into churches they will profess the truth they will know the word they will know the word better than some of the believers the new believers or whoever they are Satan those servants of, of Satan get into these churches from the outside they come in in droves they will come in they will act because like I told you they have put on a, a, a dress a robe of righteousness they will keep walking around in the church 
Apostle, calls, uh, Apostle Paul calls them the doctrine of demons. They will not create any issues in the beginning. But after some time, you will find the true color comes out. And there are so many issues in the church. That is why today, if you look at it, in the worldwide situation, so many churches are being closed, are being destroyed because of infighting, fighting inside, where people go against one another and churches get destroyed all over. In 1 Tim Timothy chapter 4 verse 1 says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith giving heed to deceiving spirits and the doctrines of demons. How does this come? It comes out of Satan's servants operating in the church. If you are well versed in the word, if you know the Bible well, you will start spotting these things very early before it becomes an issue. Jesus says there are wolves in, in, in sheep's clothing. That's in, in Matthew chapter 7 verse 15. The, Jesus himself knows that. These are the kind of Satan's people will try to come and destroy his church. Because he says in Matthew 7.15 he says beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. Nothing is new let me tell you. Our Lord knows every game in the book let me tell you. He is aware of all this and he is wonders. But the only thing is we need to go to that manual and learn what it is. Acts chapter 20 verse 30 says Also from, the, from among yourselves men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. That's what they do. That's how they split the church. They will talk flowery language. They will work out all these schemes bring them to their side and finally tell them that one day that I'm you know starting a church so you all join me and everybody blindly follows this is what happens Satan deploying tactics without God's discernment our love the love which we show to people all of that becomes absolute stupidity if you allow Satan to operate. In Philippians 1.9 it says, And this I pray that your love may, be, may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment. You have to discern who is acting who is not acting, who is truthful, who is not. Satan, what another thing which Satan does is Satan tempts people to sin. This is what he does. He tried to unsuccessfully tried the same trick on Jesus. When Jesus was in the wilderness, I'm sure all, all of you know the story. Because Satan wanted Jesus to abandon the path of suffering and obedience. Matthew chapter 4 verse 1 to 11. You will find all the satanic attempts over there on Jesus which was made. And Jesus overcame every one of them. But unfortunately... There was one guy who did not, who fell for the, Satan's tricks. And Satan operated very successfully. You know who that person is? That person is Judah of the Bible. 
in the last hours of Jesus' life, which is given in, in Luke chapter 22, verse 3 and 6. Satan came, his agents came in and, and took hold of Judah's mind and twisted it totally. And we all know what happened. In 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul warns us against this, against all, for all believers. He says, I'm afraid that as a serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. If you are not careful, you will be led away. Your devotion to Christ will be led away. You will think of a lot of other issues. Focus your mind on Christ and nothing else in this world. Satan causes sickness and disease. Jesus healed a woman, a very old woman who was bent over and who she could not straighten up. But when, when some of the people who criticized him for doing that, that healing on a Sabbath day, he said, that's in Luke 13, uh, verse 16. It says, Ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? Jesus is asking a question to the people who wanted to know how he healed somebody on a Sabbath day. Jesus saw Satan is the one who had caused the disease. In Acts 10.38, Apostle Paul described Jesus as the one who went about doing good and healing all those who were oppressed. So many places Jesus did that and he was not bothered about whether it is a Sabbath day or not. And let me tell you, the devil oppressed people with sickness. This is one of the, his main designs, what he does. But let me tell you, that don't make the mistake of saying that every sickness in this world is because of the devil. No, that's not what I'm saying. Sometimes to be sure that this thorn in your, you know, body is not a design of our own God to take your attention from something which you are doing wrong. He does certain things to grab your attention for your own sanctification, for your own well-being. That's in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 7. But there are other instances to Satan in fact it was not this man it was not that this man sinned or his parents but that the works of God may be displayed in him this is what Jesus told in John chapter 9 verse 3 in fact Jesus felt at that time there is no need to bring Satan into it and confuse people Satan is a master of taking up the word of God out of people's hearts and choke, literally choke their faith. That person will come up with so many, many questions when you ask anything about the faith. I've seen this. Battling issues regarding the faith. What did Jesus tell us about the parable on the, of the soils, of, of the four soils in Mark chapter 1, chapter 4, verse 1 to 9? In the seed of God, when it is sown, and some falls on the path, and the birds quickly take it away. I've seen this. I've seen it in the lives of people. 
I have seen in the life of one particular person who came in on a, one day before Christmas and insisted on being baptized. We had no intention of baptizing him. He insisted saying that no, I have seen in your lifestyle, I have seen I want to accept Jesus and nobody else as the Lord and Savior of my life. And we took him because when a person is so anxious and, and, and full of gusto to get baptized, how can we ever refuse that? We took him and baptized him. On a day, I still remember where it was actually very difficult for us to find a place where we could baptize him. Somehow we got out of a place, a hotel, and got it done. A couple of months later, no talk about Jesus, no talk about anything else, because Satan has captured him and he's off into the hands of Satan. Jesus explains in, in verse 15, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word which is sown in them. That's exactly what happened. When we started sowing the word in him, the Satan comes along and takes out the word. Satan snatches the word because he hates. He hates anything concerning faith. Anything which concerns faith, which produces faith rather, he's against that. Satan will always snatch the word because he hates faith. And the word that produces faith in the Bible. Anything concerning that, he would take it away. Apostle Paul beautifully puts it in Thessalonians. He puts it like this in, in 1 Thessalonians 3 5. I sent to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter, the tempter is that Satan, had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. It always happens. See, because Paul, Apostle Paul knew that Satan's design is to choke off the faith of people and the word of God. This person whom we baptized hardly three months, hardly four months after that he lost. Why the Satan got hold of him? Satan does signs and wonders also, let me tell you. It's not only the Lord who did so many wonders for us when he walked on this earth. 2 Thessalonians, Apostle Paul tells us, Apostle Paul tells us, the coming of the lawless one by the activity of Satan will be with all power and with signs and wonders of the lie. Very clearly the Apostle Paul is telling us there will be guys who come and show you all this. They will do signs and wonders. They will do all kinds of things. But let me tell you it's all lie. It's all deception. Some will translate it as signs and wonders. But it's all unreal. It's not true. But some people may tell you that it, it, Satan can do fake, only fake miracles. Not really, I doubt it. Because even if it is true, let me tell you, his fake, whatever he fakes is good enough to people, for people to get convinced. To convince the real, any, anybody looking at it. The only reason why I doubt Satan, let me tell you, and do not believe any of his fake miracles which he performed, if you go into Matthew chapter 14 verse 24, Jesus describes the last days like this. False prophets, false Christ, false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. Elect means you and me. 
Jesus himself has warned us. He has told us to be careful. Those signs and wonders, who are they do is or performing are all false. Let your you know, confidence, your belief, your understanding be grounded in something more superior, much deeper, deeper than the quality of, of Satan who's doing these signs and wonders to impress you. Some of them do it in the name of Jesus. They say, Lord, Lord, we have done so many mighty miracles in your name. And the Bible records that, you know what Jesus replied? He said, I don't even know you. I never knew you. Depart from you, you workers of iniquity. This is what he said in Matthew chapter 7, 22, 23. The problem was not that signs and wonders weren't real. That's not the issue. It can appear real to you or a layman or somebody who does not understand the word properly. But they were done in the service of sin. To promote sin, it was done. And another thing which Satan does is he keeps on constantly accusing believers before God. Those who have read the Job, uh, book of Job, you know the conversation. Where have you gone? God asked, and he says, I've been loafing around the... Yeah, I can't find a single guy who's truthful to you. Let's go to Revelations, chapter 12, verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now come, the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah... For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. This was Lucifer who was thrown down from the heavens. Satan's defeat is sure. Let me understand that. But his acquisitions before God hasn't changed, hasn't ceased, hasn't stopped. The path to victory in this warfare, let me tell you that, is to hold on to Christ, who has already given him a, a decisive blow to Satan. In 1 John 3.8, I'm going to read a few verse, Bible verses. 1 John 3.8 says, The Son of God appeared to destroy the works of devil. Hebrews 2.14 says, Christ took on the human nature that through death he might destroy him who has the power of death and that is the devil. Another one I would read is from Colossians 2.15. God disarmed the principalities and powers and made public example of them triumphing over them in him. In other words, God struck a decisive blow at the cross of Calvary. That's when the whole thing he showed to the devil and his cohorts. James gives us a beautiful example or advice rather. James 4, 7. He says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. It's up to your hands. If you go in and uh, accept Satan and, and play ball with whatever he wants, he will take you in. But if you resist, he will flee from you because he knows there is no chance. You are wasting time against this guy. If he comes into our household, he will flee because he knows everybody here is blood washed and we are believers. And we will resist. We will fight that battle. And he will have to flee. He has got no chance. You may ask, how do you do that? Here is how you do it. 
go to Revelations, Revelations 2, 12, 11. They have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the words of that testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. That's how you fight this battle. By the words of your testimony. Because believers always spoke the, the truth and the triumph of Christ. They talked the truth about his faith, our faith in Christ. They did not fear death, all the believers. Triumph over that because we don't have to be afraid of the Satan. And we've got the operating manual, or rather I would call it for this particular sermon, I would call it the, the war manual. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 6, verses 17, 17 and 18. I talked about this earlier. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of spirit, which is the word of God, praying. Underline that word in your Bible. Praying at all times in the spirit, with all prayer and supplication. Supplication means you pray to God what you want things done. Because by this end times are coming and Satan rages. Jesus calls us to be careful, be attent attentive. In Luke 21, 36, Jesus tells us, watch us, watch at all times. Praying that you have the strength to escape all these things that will take place and to stand before the Son of Man. What an assurance he's giving us. He says, don't worry. Fight your battle. And you will overcome all this and you will stand before me one day in heaven. Jesus fought the devil on our behalf. He did it for you and for me. With this weapon of prayer which he gave us. He, I'll go into Luke chapter 22 verse 31 to 32. This is what he told his disciple Peter at that time. Satan has asked to have you that he might sift you like wheat. Okay, I'll repeat that. Satan has asked, asking who? Ask Jesus to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. Jesus telling his own disciple, and don't worry, I have prayed for you. Your faith will not fail you. Jesus is only illustrating to us that the opposition to these kind of satanic attempts is only through prayer. And let me tell you, Jesus instructed us a very simple daily prayer of protection. What does it say? Lead us not on to temptation, but deliver us from evil. A simple prayer. To deliver us from that unsuccessful temptation of Satan, the evil one. All believers need to pray that every day, hallowed be our name. The prayer which Jesus gave us.
The question is, do you confront the designs of a Satan with very focused and determined prayers? Give it back to him through prayer. There are no, let me tell you, there is no neutral zone. Either you are with him or you are a believer who is fighting this battle. The question is not whether you want to be in war. Everybody is in it because Satan is taking steps to catch all of you, all of us, you, you and me included. We either get defeated by the devil and thus like cattle being taken into the slaughter, we just take and do nothing about it. And he has a good time, great time. Satan will be laughing all the way. Or we resist. Resist and be firm in our faith. 1 Peter 5 9. The time, either you try him by the blood of the Lamb and the words of your testimony. Or let me tell you, you will be enslaved by, by Satan. Therefore, let me tell you, share in the suffering as a good soldier of Christ. There may be small hardships. Bear that. That's not an issue in life. But be a good soldier for Christ. 2 Timothy verse 2, chapter 2, verse 3. And in it, it says, and wage the good warfare, praying without ceasing. Prayer is the answer for all your battles. The victory which comes to us is only through faith. This is exactly what the devil does not want us to think about clearly. He doesn't want us to think about faith. He wants to keep things vague so that he can disarm us, can imprison us with crazy thoughts. So then you land up in a situation one day and say, I have no peace of mind. Let me tell you, Jesus wants you to think clearly. He wants you to know the truth because the truth will set you free. And the word of God can only set you free, nothing else. You have to abide. Jesus very clearly says, you abide in my word. You are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth and the truth shall set you free. John chapter 8 verse 31 to 32. No point getting into arguments, let me tell you that. Most important battles are lost through arguments. Let me tell you, Jesus is no less warrior than the days of the old. All I'm saying, come to him as willing soldiers. Come to him, the Prince of Peace. I learned to say the words. He trains my hands for battle, for war. Psalm 144 verse 1. It is Jesus who will do that. Let me tell you in closing. The prayer, the spiritual warfare prayer. You need to remember very clearly. There are a few tips which I'm giving you is. You need to pray every day. The prayer from Matthew 6. 13 Our Father thou art in heaven A prayer Because this is a prayer In my opinion It's a very simple prayer It's one of the most powerful Most powerful in our Spiritual welfare 
You cannot have a, a, a more powerful prayer than that. He's asking God to keep you safe, keep you, deliver you against all evil. Deliver us from the evil one, very clearly. Because it's a call to Almighty God to deliver us from the evil one. The evil one who's constantly chasing us and using all kinds of tactics to get us. The evil one with his designs, with his demons, And let me tell you that it's a very, very short prayer. You don't have to worry about it it's sitting there and praying for hours. No, it's a very, very small prayer. Yet Jesus chose, he chose to include it in this very effective prayer against the, the on, on spiritual warfare. Jesus is the one who chose that prayer. He is the one who chose that prayer for us to pray to the Father in heaven to deliver us from the evil one. He chose that prayer. If you pray that every day, let me tell you, God will answer. So this evening, let me tell you, my father says this evening, take a stand and use my word. Refuse to allow yourself to get weary. Stand under that faith in prayer. It does not matter what the enemy brings and tells me. It does not belong, it does not matter at all. Because you belong to me. I will not listen to that devil. You must take that stand against him and resist the maneuvers of Satan in this world. Refuse to allow Satan's tactics to overwhelm you or bring discouragement. Bring you to a situation where you have no peace of mind. Be strong and resolute. Knowing that our Lord is with us. And it is God's will, let me tell you, to, for us to have victory. For us to obtain victory, we will never lose because we are on the winning side. How can we lose when God is on our side? All I can tell you is that accept the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have not done so, please accept this evening and your life will be changed totally. In Jesus name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. We will have a song this evening by the worship team. Come.
the benediction may the power that raised jesus from the dead strengthen your inner beings for every good work and may the blessings of father or god almighty the son and the holy spirit be with you this day and forevermore and all the saints of god said amen amen god bless you guys and uh, see you next week next saturday uh, at the same time 7 pm and we'll have a, another session of worship and sharing of the word please do tell your friends and neighbors and and who you can so that they will be blessed by hearing the undiluted word of god and have time also with the worship look forward to seeing you next week at the same time god bless you